Thank you very much. I wasn't <coughs> actually sure what managing the whole patient meant. And what I thought I'd do was take you through a couple of uh, patients who have had multiple changes in therapy for a variety of reasons and, and go through that decision process, hopefully with a little, uh, little data. The major decision points in uh, treating people with CML is your choice of initial therapy. You've heard a lot about that already. Switching TKIs, uh, and that will be uh, the focus of the two patients. And you heard a lovely lecture about stopping treatment, but one of the most important things to remember from that lecture is that patients have to be treated for a long time before you can stop successfully. Not everyone can be stopped successfully. So all of the principles of appropriate management of TKIs in these patients are still relevant for the overwhelming majority of patients for years. So in terms of what to start with, uh, what are the results of trials would start with imatinib? Uh, since it's likely that we will be using it as initial therapy in almost all patients should eventually the United States catch up to the rest of the world and have inexpensive uh, drug. As uh, Hagop said, it's absolutely extraordinary how slow it's been to see the price drop in the United States. But the fact of the matter is that once it does drop, insurance companies are going to tell us what we're going to be prescribing. The other point to remember is that no matter what you start with, every one of the trials demonstrated that 30 to 40 percent of patients switch to something else. So it, you have to learn how to use all of these drugs, if you will, in a substantial fraction of patients. And just a reminder in terms of what you start with is that none of these sequences of therapy, starting imatinib, starting second generation, and then switching as necessary, have shown a survival advantage compared to imatinib alone. You've seen, well, you haven't seen this slide. This is to remind you of something that uh, people forget with their addiction to um, major molecular response. This is five-year follow-up of the IRIS trial. The top line is people who had a major molecular response sustained at 18 months. This line, which is the same, is people in complete cytogenetic response maintained at 18 months. The results are exactly the same. So while you would prefer to be deeper, it's not mandatory to be deeper to live forever while taking a TKI. You saw this already. This is 83% long-term disease-free survival on the IRIS study. Same thing in Germany, except many, many more patients, almost 1,500 patients receiving imatinib-based therapy, 83% long-term survival from starting on imatinib. So for almost all patients, this is uh, the appropriate choice. So how about a case? This was a gentleman who was one of the first TKI pioneers, actually. He started in January 2001, 47 years old, had uh, gone through the torture of prior interferon therapy. He was clinically chronic phase, his marrow was chronic phase, but in addition to the Philadelphia chromosome, he had a translocation 911 in all of the Philadelphia chromosome positive cells. At that time, we called this accelerated phase, certainly clonal evolution, and the recommendation was to start at a higher dose, and he was begun on imatinib 600. We now know that if these people are treated successfully, that is, achieve a good response like he did, their behavior is almost the same as people who did not have clonal evolution at the, the time of diagnosis. Uh, he achieved very rapidly, he achieved a complete cytogenetic response. We were doing marrows at that time every three months, torture for everybody. And um, this was maintained, followed up with fish every four months till 2005. 2006, we started doing PCR. He had a very low level, which remained stable, monitored every four months for years until 2009 when the PCR increased. We repeated it, and it's always important to repeat it. It um, 
remained very high. At that time, we did not have the uh, uh, international scale, but this is approximately on the international scale where you would have some concern about cytogenetic relapse. He was quite compliant with the drug. We recommended a marrow. He declined it. We continued to follow. He, the PCR remained elevated. He finally agreed to a marrow, and he had a cytogenetic remission. But interestingly, um, he did not have that uh, extra abnormality at that time. His comorbidities or side effects at that time consisted of chronic mild diarrhea. He had gynecomastia beginning about a year after the imatinib was um, begun. He had fatigue and mild memory deficits, and neither of these were uh, improved with androgen replacement. Um, low testosterone and occasionally gynecomastia will occur perhaps in as many as 5 to 10 percent of males on the drug, and certainly testosterone levels should be checked in people who are having a bunch of constitutional complaints. He also had Gilbert syndrome with uh, variable levels of bilirubin. Just a reminder, this is um, from Tim's colleague, Susan Branford, that duplicate values of PCR can vary substantially. And it's very unusual to recommend, almost unheard of, changing therapy on a single PCR value. It should be re uh, repeated. And of course, what you don't want to see is a gradual increase over time. So we discussed further therapy with him. And these are the results of switching to a second generation TKI in people who have had recurrence on a first generation TKI. And this is the desatinib dose finding uh, uh, study, four different doses. Eventually, 100 was felt to be ideal. Probably that's not correct any longer. But the point is that the progression free survival is about 60%. So, switching to a second line drug is not a guarantee that the patient um, is going to do well. And in fact, at that time, and even now, I consider a transplant evaluation should I be switching, or certainly if there's not a rapid response to the second generation. 